I tell myself, I have all the time in the world. Because if I didn't tell myself that, I think it would really clamp me down as an artist. It gives me more open freedom to think that I have all the time in the world. Because our textile art, they're full of time. You're listening to Seamside, where we explore the inner work of textiles. I'm your host, Zach Foster, and each episode I sit down and sew with a different artist, and we talk about what working with cloth has taught us about being human. I hope you enjoy. You may have noticed that I don't have any commercials on this podcast, and that's all thanks to the good folks over at the Quilty Nook. Well, I guess that was kind of a little commercial, wasn't it? But other than that, listen... Quilty Nook are some of the friendliest, most inquisitive, and feral group of quilters I know. Their membership support helps make projects like this podcast possible, and for that I am truly, truly thankful. If you're looking for community and inspiration, I'd encourage you to check out the Nook and come be our guest for a few days. You can find out more about the Nook in the link in the show notes below. I hope to see you there. Now, y'all know how much I love your reviews. Listen to this recent one, for example, from Beverly, who said, Seamside has been an absolute gift to me. It helps me to remember that we're all human and that we all experience challenges in our everyday life. I love hearing how artists confront their difficulties by making creative outlets for the world to feel and see. If what Beverly says is striking a chord with you, could you do me a favor? Write a little review on Apple Podcasts. It is the number one best way for other folks to discover the magic that's happening right here in every episode of Seamside. I sure would appreciate it. Now, in this episode, I sit down with Judy Martin, who's coming to us from an island in the middle of a freshwater lake in Ontario, Canada. We talk about how we can use time as a material in our work how we can meet ourselves and our world and the textiles we work with, and how our creative practice can evolve over the course of a lifetime. I hope you enjoy this conversation with my new friend, Judy Martin. Judy, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Oh, I'm really, really honored to be here, Zach. Thank you for asking me. Can you paint the picture for us a little bit? Help us see in our mind's eye where you're sitting right now. Where I'm sitting right now? (laughs) I'm sitting right off my kitchen, actually. I have this little office area right off my kitchen, and it's also where I store all my dye books and my dye pots in a little alcove where the other people who owned this house would have put the pantry, but I keep my dye stuff there. And then this is a little kind of area. I didn't have a studio when I was a mom uh, with all my children. They all had all the rooms. So this is all I had for quite a while, but I could pin stuff up on my ceiling tile pin wall, which I still use just to look at sometimes, and cook, you know, even just while I'm, just to contemplate it. So I've always had a studio in the house, even when I was busy with my kids. So that's where I'm sitting, and I live in Canada. I don't know. If everybody knows that, I'm a Canadian, and I live on an island in a Great Lake. I was looking on the map this morning because I always like to try to understand Mm -hmm. where me and the person I'm talking to orient ourselves, you know, on the planet. I live in a beautiful place, and it has been my intent to try to always live in beauty and bring my children up in beauty. And so, yeah, I'm really lucky, very lucky. And we see that beauty and that stillness and quietness in so much of your work. And I'm sure we'll get into that in just a moment. What did you bring to work on today while we're talking? I brought brought a a one-patch quilt that I am hand-piecing. It's something I can take with me. It's made from two-inch squares of leftover damask that I dyed with natural dyes for other projects. So I had all these small ends, you know, and I just cut them all into into squares and I'm sewing them round and round and round like a, a just a started in the, in the center and I'm just adding and it's getting bigger and bigger. It's quite, and I'm using up all the cloth. I get the cloth and then I, I cut it up and I use it all up until it's all gone and then I start another color. So it doesn't really have a, a pattern. It has a sort of a not know to go on kind of 
of effect and we'll just see. It may be that I may have to fix it, but right now I'm just really enjoying it. It's all very light colored right now. It's here. You can see it, Zach, but nobody else can. It reminds me of the expression you hear from time to time. It, it makes its own sauce, yeah. <laughs> right? It doesn't have a pattern, but it'll make its own yeah. pattern. It's, yeah, I, I do like to work without a pattern. But I, then I have also got this rigor of working with just one patch. So I guess I am working with a pattern. So. And so how will you know when you're done with that? When I run out of cloth. Or when it gets to be the size of my real studio wall, which is 85 by 85. Yeah. Constrained by real estate. <laughs> <laughs> that's big enough. Yeah, I, I think that's a good time to switch it up and go on to another project at that point. I am sitting here at my kitchen table in Brooklyn, and I am sewing on a quilt made out of bath towels, which I've never done before. I've never worked with terry cloth like this. Wow. But I am loving how the applique terry cloth on terry cloth ends up mushing together. Yeah. Right? You can imagine all those little, I don't know, almost like little cilia. I think, I think of them like, you know, in our, in our lungs, our throat, you know, all those little twisty threads of terry cloth just kind of mingling together and fusing together and it's is it all hand actually hand? coming together quite nice hand work just all, all by hand wow. all by hand i have never yeah. worked with terry cloth wow that's amazing why did you choose choose to do it well i chose it because i saw them i was at the goodwill outlet and they have these bins where you know you can buy stuff by the pound and somebody had dumped three green towels three slightly different shades of green into the bin together and i just saw them sitting together it's almost like you go to a shelter and you see like a litter of puppies and you came for one but you take the whole litter right <laughs> these towels just needed to stay together so I, I grabbed all the towels and knew i'd work with them in a project at some point and in this series that i'm working on now that i'm calling southern white amnesia uh, i'm thinking a lot about body and physicality and there's something about a bath towel that goes straight to nakedness and vulnerability and so that's what I'm hoping to tap that's into with this project wonderful yeah that's amazing I like that and I think that's really important for a, somebody who's making material objects you know to, to let them speak and they have that story like you said they about nakedness and vulnerability and cleanliness and greenness <laughs> a lot of ways that making is a conversation and we hear that a lot but i think of one of the reasons we have conversations like you and i are having now is that not a single one of us has all the answers or anything close to all the answers but together we can get, we can approximate, we can get a little closer to that, that truth or that core. And I feel like when we as artists allow the materials to speak back, they open up some understanding for us. And I know with working with these bath towels, I'm thinking a lot more about the body and the skin than I would if I were working yeah, with yeah, yeah. Mm, feed sacks yeah. or repurposing. Yeah, and so getting your mind thinking that way makes you see more in your in your lap but also probably triggers ideas to do another piece or new work on a similar or a next step you know beauty or the problem judy <laughs> and the work is never done is it i'm wondering you know we normally with these conversations here on okay. seam side just kind of jump right in you know we don't usually do a whole lot of backstory but i do find what you were sharing with me before we got to talking about your grandmothers and their interaction with textiles and their experience with textiles, really, really interesting. And I think it's good for folks who may just be learning about your work to begin to get a ground of understanding of where you're coming from. Could you share with us a little bit about your grandmothers and the role they played and how your Noah um, Sure, I will, is? because um, I, even though I didn't really think of it, they didn't teach me hands-on how to sew or do anything. But they worked as artists themselves with, with textiles and were, were a kind of a role model, I guess, without me realizing it when I was a child. My maternal grandmother, my mother's mother, gifted me a 
a wonderful velvet penguin when I was little, like before five, maybe three or four. It was black velvet, and you know, it was silk velvet. It was the real deal. It was so soft. And then a, a white, real deal, silk satin tummy on that. And so these, these authentic softness of this sewn object that she had made and gave me had a real big impact on how much I, I realized, I think, at that young age, how important touch is to us. It just, it just it speaks so much. And I still love to use silk velvet in my work. In fact, most of my pieces have a little bit of velvet in them. And maybe I'm just acknowledging her. And my other, my father's mother uh, um, spoke Finnish. She was a Finnish immigrant and uh, was famous apparently in her, when she was in Canada, in that little rural Finnish community where everybody else spoke Finnish for how fast she could weave a rag rug. So I, my uncle Henry told me, oh, she was famous and people would come and bring their rags and she would have it done for them in two days. And uh, he gave me her loom. He said, I'm so glad you came to visit me because they lived really far away from where I live. We went there for a family occasion and he, he said, here you are with your van and your husband. Let's put that loom of your grandmother's on the roof. And we did. So <laughs> I still have this we don't really know how to put it together, but we're keeping it. We're going to we're going to figure it out. My daughter, one of my daughters, is very wanting to get it out someday and actually use it. I am not a weaver. I wanted to be a weaver, but I never I never became a weaver. I became a quilter. Mm, I suppose because I didn't have I have a loom. <laughs> Maybe if I'd had this loom, I would have I would have gone another direction. You know. So those are my grandmothers. I had a moment, Judy, about a year and a half ago, where I was just rummaging through the thrift shop, and my hands came across something, then my eyes came across it in that order. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a worm That's tunnel right. back to my earliest textile memory. So you're talking about your velvet penguin. I had a gold acrylic blanket growing up. It's uh -huh. a very normal acrylic blanket, you know, nothing fancy. And it had... Um, I'm sure it was a synthetic satin sashing around all four sides. And when I touched that blanket, that gold acrylic blanket in the thrift shop bin, it mm -hmm. just took me right back to being in bed as a little kid, little person. I can remember the coolness of that satin binding, and I can remember the, the warmth, the, the plasticky warmth that, that acrylic brings. Oh, yeah. And so, of course, I had to buy that blanket. I mean, it was just, it was like a relic from the past. And similarly... And this is something interesting to consider, isn't it? That just like you continue using velvet, and maybe there's some kind of connection with that early penguin memory, mm -hmm. I use a lot of gold in my work. Not as a, a dominant primary color, but it seems to be um, a thread that goes throughout a lot of my pieces. It always seems like a color palette is just not quite mm -hmm. rounded out unless it has some gold in it. Are, are your are your daughters into um, textiles? It sounds like one of them I'd is. I'd say they all are, um, but my youngest is uh, calls herself a. Um, she's a ceramic artist and a textile artist. Is how she she's multidisciplinary, but those are her two main um, media. And uh, yeah, she uh, she always loves picking my brain and and comes up with a lot of ideas. One thing that she would do with that towel is use it as her batting. So she would put something on top and then let it come. She cuts into the top cloth and, and uses blankets. And she hasn't tried terry cloth, but I wonder. As a, as a design, and I do that too, but she does it more. She, she does it more. And then my oldest daughter also uh, made quilts for all her friends' babies and for her own baby. And but um, doesn't make them as much now, but she, she says, I think I'm gonna make hand piece quilts for the cottage. Mom, would you like hand piece quilts for the cottage? I said, sure. And she, says, <laughs> she started. So I'm not I mean, gonna it say does no. take a long time to make a quilt. So we'll see how many get done. I think it's a great idea. And she has started. 
Have I've you collaborated with your daughters on a piano? Hmm. Well, um, I, yeah. Well, I've taught, I've taught my youngest how to do almost everything. With, and so sometimes I'm actually working on her pieces. But I would say the most collaboration I did was when my, I gave a quilt to my little middle child, who I haven't talked about yet, and, uh, and she wore it out. It was, it was worn out. <laughs> and so every time I visited her, I'd start mending it. So, and I'd teach her how to mend it, and she would mend it. And so we would mend this, this thing together. And so she, uh, she still has it, and it's all mended now. But it, maybe that was collaborating, I don't know. I would call that collaboration, for sure. Now, Judy, the, the last couple conversations we've had here on Seamside, one was with Mar Grace Ambrose, and the other one was Culture Fussell. The idea of parenting and mothering came up in the life of the artist. And what I'm interested to hear from you about is, you know, you and I, you and I our lives are intersecting at this very particular point in history where yeah. you were the mother of adult children at this point, yeah. whereas Mar and Coulter both have younger children. What is that like as a mother, a parent, an artist who are now able to interact with and converse with adult children who it sounds like are also involved in making and well, creative I, expression. I, that's a, thank you for asking me that because it's not just my children that I am uh, so inspired by. I am inspired by that, your generation. Like you are the age of my son, Zach, and uh, he's an architect, but very uh, thoughtful, wanting to integrate, wanting to be climate conscious, you know, really wanting to spend their lives really trying to uh, fix things. And it's really inspiring. And I'd say they're all like that. All my kids are like that. So I don't know if that's what you were asking me. I forget what you actually were asking me. But um, And then three of the I have four kids, and three of them have their own children now. So um, I'm a grandmother for those, that new generation again. And just interacting with with them when they're little is um, it's just a, I know every all grandmothers say this and I'll say it it's just wonderful <laughs> just wonderful and why is it wonderful well they go through a certain age around uh, three four five when they really start to wonder what the heck's going on in this world and I think they they trust me because I've been there, I've seen a lot of things, and I have this one little granddaughter who asks me questions. Like, she was visiting me last week, and she said, "Mom, a grandma." I said, "Yes." And she said, "Is your mother alive?" I said, "Um, no, she's not." And uh, Maya said, "Well, that's sad." And I said, "Well, let's see." 16 years ago, you know, and so I mean, this is not it doesn't sound deep, but it is deep because this little girl is thinking about mortality. She's looking at me. She's thinking she's old. She's going to die. Oh, my gosh. And so she doesn't want to say that. I think I think she's being, you know, I, I just think it's just very deep. And and I think you have to be honest with little kids when they ask you these kinds of questions of empathy in that question isn't there because obviously Maya is thinking about her mother and then able to think about you in a similar situation there's a lot of heart there what is there something when you look back on that that chapter of your life when you were a young parent right so not grandparent sure. but we're gonna go all the way back to young parent is there a piece of advice that you would have given yourself at that point in time, looking back with the wisdom of, that you have now? How to, how to continue being an artist with all those kids? Yeah, I'm thinking about especially, you know, we, we heard from Mar, we hear from Coulter, and other people that I've talked to who are also parents of young kids, that there's so, there can be um, this uh, a yeah, hairy, yeah. constant mm -hmm. rebalancing that has to happen every moment of every day mm -hmm. between children being there as a parent, being there for yourself as an artist, and how to mm -hmm. keep that balance mm -hmm. upright. 
Is there something that you could share with us as someone who's been there and, and maybe found a way to find that balance for themselves? It's very key that you uh, hold on to that, what they call me time, a little bit. And uh, I think in order to be able to, to allow your kids to be uh, themselves. And so I, 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 I would tell young mothers when I was not as old now, but when I was had teenagers, that they should just take 15 minutes a day and not worry about whether the kitchen is dirty or anything, just as soon as there's a break, like there usually is some kind of break, sometime during the day, and that's yours, you know. And if and as they get older, you can take half an hour, you know. And even when, so I, I had the timer, and I still, that is my tip now, is that I, I have a timer on my phone now, but it makes me, sit there with my work and do it and it also makes me get up from my work and do dinner you know so i use a i use a timer to this day to organize my time and give me enough me time and now of course i have more me time than than a young mom does but i it's not that i stole it from them but i i took it for me <laughs> and uh it, it is hard but I always kept, I always was an artist right through. I never, I never gave that up. Yeah. Well, I wonder too, if there's the other side of that, you know, you're saying take your me time, but you're also modeling for your children what it means to be a full whole person with varied interests and varied desires in life. That's true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I also, um, when they were little, I painted them. I really loved looking at my children. They were the most beautiful things as far as I could tell. And I would take them outside, I'd take them to the beach, and I would make these paintings of them. And I, they were so popular. All the lawyers and the doctors were, I was, would buy them for their offices and for their homes. And they were my kids. I didn't take commissions. I just painted my own children because they were just typical, you know. And so funny because watercolor is absolutely impossible to do when you have children because you have to let it dry. And I had to actually give up watercolor painting when they got to be. Maybe I, I, I fell back into my quilting, into quilting at that time because it could be interrupted by the children. And I think what that might, maybe I'm finally answering the question about modeling because with my art form as being a quilt, I could work away, put it aside, pay attention to the child, go for a walk, and then come back to work on it some more without losing too much track, you know? I mean, it was, it's a, I find the quilt able to be a mother. It helped me be a mother and gave me certain, uh, motherhood gave me a lot of subject matter for my storytelling quilts because at that time I was, doing story story quilts uh, through the wonderful code that I found in the quilt patterns. It's just so normal. <laughs> Anything but boring. You're making these beautiful pieces. And maybe this is a good time to segue to not to know, yeah, okay. but to go on. That's not a boring project. <laughs> no. Can you tell us a little bit about that? No, that it looks like a big Finnish rug, this this piece that I made. And it is kind of referencing that, I know. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you about it. I was about, I was 59, and I thought, oh my gosh. I am, I mean, maybe I was 58. I think I was 58. And um, I thought, I'm going to be 60 one of these days. And so on my 50 eighth birthday I started um, I started working with an entire skein of embroidery floss for each day I just did a daily practice of stitching this whole thing onto a piece of artist canvas uh, I it was a big enough for my lap I, I held this canvas and I would take all my extra cloth my found cloth I, ha I was a quilt maker, I was a clothing maker, I had a lot of scraps and I would just uh, couch a strip of cloth 
to the canvas until the cloth ran out until and until I ran out of one skein. So I kept doing that one a day for three years until I turned 61. 58, 59, no. Anyway, I forget exactly uh, when I, I, but it's a three year long project. So there's well over a thousand uh, skeins of thread in it. And it's, it's been on show through the States. It went on a, a show of three dimensional quilts I wouldn't really call it a quilt, but that's what they called it. And it's uh, 220 feet long and uh, 13 inches wide. And there's pictures of it on my website. And I wrote a little book about it uh, called Not to Know But to Go On. And that, that, those words are actually Agnes Martin's words. Um, uh, one of my great, uh, I, I read her writings. She talks about everything is perfect, but nothing is perfect. Um, being alone, artists should be alone. And she talks about not knowing, but going on and uh, in her beautiful writing. And so I have this little book that I, I've, uh, I wrote and people are snapping it up. And what's in the it's book? It's just then? one of my blog posts. Uh, it just talks about how how I made this quilt by um, not looking at what color the embroidery floss skein was, just sticking my hand in there and blindly choosing a, a color and then having it in my hand and saying, oh no, but I'm still working on this blue cloth and I picked this purple thread. It's not going to look good, but I would use it anyway because that's what the day brought. It brought me a purple, and I had to use it anyway, and I had to use up all that blue cloth. You know, I had to go to right to the I had used it all up. I had these, somebody told me this whole piece was about mortality, because I was cleaning my, my studio, I was finalizing things, I was ending things, and I was also talking about how fast each day goes by. It's just a whirl, you know. Uh, all of a sudden, there are your three years, and your 220 feet, and... And um, and by the way, the purple looked fantastic with the blue, as did all of the colors with every day. It looked fine once you put them all together. <laughs> no need to worry. We'll share a picture of that piece with the show, with the episode here, so people can see it. Because for me, one of the most impactful moments that you capture in that project is you've rolled out the whole piece, and it wins its way through this kind of green lawn foresty floor and it feels like an invitational path to, mm -hmm. to walk along and see where it I takes think you. it also talks as a metaphor about how we just have to approach this world that is quite worrisome sometimes and we really don't know we really don't know what the next day will bring but we just have to carry on and and do our best and it'll work out and it might not work out but we still not to know but go on and yeah that those pictures are from my my blog post about it and that's that's what the book is too it's just it's just one of the blog posts judy i wonder if this might be a, a good moment to bring in jane hirschfield when you and i were talking about this conversation thinking about what are some of the what are some of the other people we might bring into this conversation for me jane hirschfield yeah was one of the first that came to mind, the poet. Are you familiar with the poem that she wrote called well, The Bowl? Yeah, I am now, now that we've talked about it. It is beautiful, and it does remind me well, of I was. Life. You want to read it? Yeah, I, I think just so folks at yeah. home can also be in on the conversation with us, I'm going to read this poem, The Bowl, by Jane Hirschfield, and I think it speaks really nicely to what you were just saying a moment ago about the purple embroidery the floss and how it goes or it doesn't go, right? So I would love to, I'll read the poem and I would love to hear your take on it afterwards. So I think folks should know that Jane Hirschfeld is a poet. She also has a training, uh, a Buddhist training background, but she doesn't consider herself necessarily a Buddhist poet. If meat is put into the bowl, meat is eaten. If rice is put into the bowl, it may be cooked. If a shoe is put into the bowl, the leather is chewed and chewed over a sentence that cannot be taken in or forgotten. 
A day, if a day could feel, must feel like a bowl. Wars, loves, trucks, betrayals, kindness, it eats them. Then the next day comes, spotless and hungry. The bowl cannot be thrown away, it cannot be broken. It is calm, uneclipsable, rhineless. And big though it seems, fits exactly in two human hands. Hands with ten fingers, fifty-four bones, capacity strange to us almost past measure. Scented as the curve the bowl is, with cardamom, star anise, long pepper, cinnamon, hyssop. Yeah, thank you for that poem. When I remember, sometimes you have those moments with a poem that, and you're like, that is what I needed in that day. And that poem has been with me ever since. The idea that the day is a vessel, the day is a container, is neither good nor bad. All kinds of stuff might go in that container. And no matter what goes in that container, Mm -hmm. we can handle it because it fits perfectly in two human hands, 54 Mm -hmm. bones. Mm -hmm. And also about how, um, how about sometimes your day can be so bad. You can have a bad day. And Agnes Martin said, be defeated. But then the next morning, it's a new day. Get up and carry on, you know. (laughs) <laughs> Spotless and hungry, Jane yeah, Herschel so, said. Yeah, it's um, it keeps us as humans going, the fact that each day is a new day, and we can start again. Back on to whatever we did yesterday. Keep on going. If Judy, you would like to read for us something that you've written. I'm thinking particularly of maybe unfolding in trees, not thinking. Yeah. Or maybe you had something else. Well, I, share. I'm really, um, yeah. You asked me about whether I'd read that, and I, I don't know if it's if it's going to be as um, effective without the pictures. What do you think from the blog? But maybe I'll just tell a little bit about the pictures because the reason I wrote this poem, which I guess it is a poem, is because I was making a piece that was tall and silky and with a little bit of velvet but I'd also made a lot of tucks in it and it looked like kind of like a tower or a ladder and it was by working on it I was every time I do handwork I go into this kind of dream world and so I I just was I just I I guess that's what enough set up for what what I'm going to read then um the pictures are of this piece that looks like a big, tall ladder, I guess, hanging in a tree, hanging from a tree. So the title is Unfolding in the Trees, Not Thinking. A vertical piece like a tower, like something from another century with stairways that go up into the attic, where there is a fairy window, where there is a daydream, where there is poetry, where there are no storms, not really. Where we stop reading, where we stop thinking, where we recognize, yet continue upward, past the round window that doesn't open, towards the ceiling so high. It's a narrow space. Like I said, it's a tower. It's intimate, close and soft and dreamy. The round window watches. It sees your memory. It views your dream. Oh, your serene face. I know it's a cover-up. I know it's a blanket. I know you are alone. Is part of that poem for you a wish or a hope for somebody? A hope or a wish for somebody. I think it... It was just to me. It was my own self. Um, And I'm talking about this quilt, and I think the last part, I know it's a (laughs) cover-up. I know it's just a blanket. You have a... There's so much going on, you know. There's so much going on in our inner inner worlds, and 
Yeah. And I think it's not just me. Everybody has a lot going on. I think it speaks to not only the journey, similar to what we're talking about with not to know, but to go on, you know, this kind of pathway that this piece feels like now, instead of going horizontally across the landscape, we're climbing into this tower. But it's not only the journey, it's also speaking, to me at least, of the, the power that textiles have to be both very a very known quantity, a very domestic quantity, and simultaneously something with power and something transformative. The thing that, that's the space as a quilter mm-hmm. I like to operate in. Because I feel like when people look at some of my pieces and they're like, for example, this one I'm working on now, they're like, oh, it's a towel. I know what mm-hmm. a towel is. Mm-hmm. That gives me room to say, mm-hmm. oh, yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let's look at this towel again. Yeah. And I think also, yes, it's certainly for the viewer who looks at it and recognizes the towel. But it also is for us, the makers, when we work with the textiles, um, as we're handling them and as we're and towers or quilts or we are also working with our body, like our body is um, repetitively, if we're doing handwork, which both you and I do, uh, stitching and that motion and being able to, uh, it's just something rhythmic that sets us off, sets me off anyway, as I, into this dream world, into this huge, immense, vast place that is the inside of me. And that's why I love making textiles. And I want to try and make that feeling in my textiles for other people to get just from looking at because they know what they feel like. Everybody knows what cloth feels like. We touch it all the time. But to have that kind of poetic resonance is what it's called with something just like you have when you look at the moon or when you look at the sunset or when you... It just makes you go into your own self more than... And and you... you, I think it's with the towels too. It's the same thing. They... It's communication. Yeah. Not doing any sewing here. <laughs> it's too, too interesting of a conversation. <laughs> I'm just holding the towel. I'm not sewing either. That's okay. Um, so, Judy, I'm wondering if, you know, you mentioned a few minutes ago that you did a lot of work earlier in your artistic journey with storytelling quilts and things like that. But I know that nowadays, especially with the show that you have, that you think... Mm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you're you're operating less with a specific story, it seems like, and introducing more space for people to bring themselves and their own stories. Would you say that's accurate? Yeah. I leave a lot of, um, it's more simple, a simplistic, simply, no, simplicity. The aesthetic of simplicity is what I use. Uh, So there is enough space but also, there's so many stitches. I do a lot of stitching. And if the stitching is um, repetitive or rhythmic, it's, it's almost like, you know, when you look over a field of grass or you look over a lake and there's these little ripples. And, or there's a fire in the fireplace. You know, you just watch those little marks and you go into this, like I said, this this trance kind of place or this inner world. And so, yeah, there's empty space, but it's got these small marks. And uh, that's the that's the trick, I guess, I've been using uh, in the last 10 years, which is more, more poetic, I think, than storytelling. And that it's um, not specific to any kind of message I'm trying to give. It's just... It allows more, it allows an openness for people to understand uh, their own, their own poem, I guess, and my poem, and just, it's very universal, I guess is what I'd say, more a universal kind of feeling than a specific one. 
when I when I look at so much of your recent work, it's there's mm -hmm. room for me to have my mm -hmm. own response to That's it. That's great. Glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have any? Um, I mean, I don't want to say rituals, but rituals points at what I want to ask. Do you have any steps, things that you do as part of your process to gather yourself, gather your energies to start working on a project? On a project or just that bowl of a day of um, reading my old journals. And uh, because I've been keeping journals since I was in my 30s, my early 30s, uh, I have a lot of them. And uh, it's not the older ones that I'm as interested in, but I am now. I'm reading, I'm reading them all, and I'm typing them into my laptop. So every m morning when I wake up, I do a half hour. And I'm putting them all in the same bookcase now. I talk about this, and I think people shake their heads. You know, why don't you just burn them? But, you know, I'm an interesting person, and I'm finding out all this stuff about me. And I, I was interesting then, too, and I'm interesting now. And... I also find in the newer journals ideas that I almost forgot. And so they come forward again. And so it's really, I guess when you said, you used the word gather me, gathering myself for a project. But yeah, it gathers me as an artist for the day and gets me, gets me going. That's one of my rituals. And the other one is trying to then do an hour of creative work. And usually it's stitching by my window. I usually do an hour of morning stitching, just quiet. And But lately I've been painting again. I've been painting uh, watercolors of all these ideas I can't get done because I'm an old lady now, you know, and I'm not going to get all these quilts made. And so I started painting them. There's one right here. You can see it, Zach. It's, a <laughs> it's just a, a quilt, but I'm, I'm putting some red uh, thread into it. So it's going to be thread and paint. And we'll get a picture of that for folks so they can see it too. It'd be nice for them to have the visual. I want to circle back to your journals because I'm also a journaler. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I find it really helpful to take this universe of thoughts that are just bouncing all over the place and squeeze yeah. them into some kind of yeah. linear form, right? Just getting them down on the page. How long have you been transcribing oh, your journals? Oh, the transcribing has only been... Maybe 10 years, yeah. And what <laughs> prompted you to rewrite what you've already written? I don't know. I, I think, well, I want, I told, I, I am burning them one at a time. Yeah. Once I get the whole. After you transcribe it, you burn it? Yes, but they take too long for me to do one at a time. And that's too boring. I mean, I, I mean, I mean, I don't have. So what I do is I do half an hour in 2005. I open it up. And I start in at the beginning, and I go to my half hour goes, and then I put it in the shelf. And the next day I do 1985, and I, you know, and so it goes in there too. And so right now, it doesn't really make sense, but I'm just, just trying to catch. And but in my laptop, it's chronological. You see, everything is chronological. I'm sorting myself out. I think that's what I'm doing. Maybe I want to write. A memoir. A lot of artists write memoirs, you know. So <laughs> gives me the idea more than just journaling, but transcribing your journals, because that's a whole other yeah. layer, right? Mm -hmm. That's the whole. I, I just have this image of you keeping yourself company. Yeah. You're keeping the 1985 you company. You're keeping the 2005 oh, you really company. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, love that. Yeah, I am my own best friend when I'm doing this. Yeah, it's. Uh, Sort of taking a, taking that young woman by her hand and seeing what happened to her, and reading some of my dialogue that I I would write the dialogue that the family would say to each other verbatim, and I read it out loud sometimes to my husband. I said, "Listen to this," and I'll read him something, and it's hilarious because it's exactly what happened, what the kids said, and what he said, or what I said. Thing that you've noticed. If you, if you step back and zoomed out and you're looking at your journals over time, what's one of the... I'm oh, well, it definitely it is. Um, but now all I, all I write about is my work and my ideas. And if I'm listening to this podcast, I might have my journal beside me 
And if if you said something beautiful or you read that poem, I might say, oh, i got to write that down. You know, I would have to take notes on what's going on that stimulates me as, an, as a person of my age right now. And so they actually, they work more as idea catchers and savers for me right now. And uh, help me be help me continue to be intellectually aware of what's going on and and um, like I was reading this morning about something I learned a few years ago that Mer Mer Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, wrote about phenomenology and I I love the idea of phenomenology which I feel is about <sighs> your body like you know how things are because you're living through them. And so that's, I think, the main idea of him. But he described it with a textile metaphor, so I'll just tell you. Braiding is when you take three strands and you go back and forth with them so that you bring one to the front and one to the middle and one to the back, like, you know, how you braid a pigtail or how you make a rope. You braid, and so one part is going in and out of the other part. Where with you weaving, you have a, a warp that goes like that straight, and then the weft is individual and goes in, in and out of it. And so there's two sides, but it's they're not so interconnected as a braid. So he had the he said that when we think of ourselves as a braid, um, you are see you can see and you are also being seen at the same time or you touch somebody but you're also being touched at the same time so it's more uh, it's more integral and so it's we are all just solid in his idea of phenomenology rather than separated I don't know if I got it completely right but I, I taught myself it again this morning because I read about it in my journal favorite Rilke poems I think it's called The Walk and it's short and he's describing you know going on a walk one day and not knowing where he was pointed towards where he would end up but when he finally gets to what becomes the end of the walk he sees it the entire time he's been walking towards himself and he's mm -hmm. standing on top of the hill waving himself onward mm -hmm. meeting and being met mm -hmm. interesting yeah, well, I think there is one thing I wanted to say about my work in textiles is that it is taking me more and more and more into this inner person. Like, like I'm waving at myself from inside myself as I keep on getting closer to myself. The self is huge and, and inside of us and interesting and worthwhile to go visit. Some of your pieces strike me as almost mandalas. You have several pieces that are circular in nature. Yeah. Is that something that you think about? Well, yeah. Well, the circle is a symbol for the self. And it's about as perfect as we can get if we're going to... Um, it also has these cosmic qualities of things that we like to look at in the sky, like the sun and the moon. And Yeah, I, I, uh, I do use circles almost in every piece. I try, okay, this one's not going to have a circle. But I rarely can get away without putting one or two in. They just, they feel so great. I think there's a tension with a circle that a circle seems to encompass everything. But by the act of drawing a circle, you're also delimiting. You're also saying there are things on the inside and there's things on the outside. There are things that are me, if you're talking about the self, and there's things that aren't me. So it's... At least what is so, uh, what attracts me so much to the idea of a circle is this idea that it feels like it contains everything but also excludes things. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, uh, Jeanette Winterson wrote something like that. Oh, she would uh, draw an imaginary circle around herself and, um, and walk around with this imaginary circle around herself. I think. In her book, uh, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, have you ever read that book? I put that quote is... Sure it? have. Yeah. It's... But that uh, I hadn't really thought... I think about the square as being limiting because it's... 
I think about a circle and a square because some of my pieces are circles and squares. And so there's a square. It's it's famous for being four corners in a box, you know. And you put a circle inside that square, a circle seems more dynamic because it is, there is no real beginning or end to it. It's sort of like it's in motion where the square is not. So I, I've sometimes thought about the square being the body and this circle being the spirit within the body that is dynamic and moving or... Um, because a lot of my work is circles and squares. Squares within circles. No, circles within squares. You know what I mean. So Judy, as a way of wrapping up, you know, we've spent time together today thinking about your work as a young parent and how in the last decade or so you've been intentionally incorporating more space and maybe less meaning to give people room for their own resonance when they experience your work. Continuing with this arc of yours, where, where, where is it taking you? What are we going to see from Judy in the future? Yeah, I'm still going to work on my work. Yeah, I am still, still going to do a lot of hand piecing as much as I can. And I'm not going to stop making large pieces because to me uh, that's really important. And um, so I have all these ideas in my journal. So one of the things I've been using is is trying to get some of them just painted because it's faster to paint a quilt. And then I can see, well, that wasn't such a great idea anyway. Or sometimes they're so good, I think, okay, I still have to make this in fabric, you know. Uh, but I have all these ideas. And so I said, Judy, just paint your ideas. And people are liking to buy these paintings, you know. So I thought, well... It doesn't hurt to get them out. Then they're out in the world, and I don't feel frustrated. But I am still going to be making four or five large pieces. Uh, I have an exhibition in England next summer, 2024. And uh, I'm going to, she, she, they said they just want quilts. It's at the Festival of Quilts, actually, in Birmingham. And um, just quilts. And I, okay, I want to make hand piece quilts for that. and. No, that's that's demanding. But uh, it does make me think. I haven't got that much time left, and um, I got this letter from my cousin, and it's so funny because she asked me the same thing. Um, can I read part of this letter? Is, Please, is there time yes. to do that? Oh, plenty. Okay, she said, "Dear Judy, I was thinking about getting older and coming to the time in your life when you can't do things." It started me thinking about your art and how you have to travel and promote your work and how you may have a million ideas to do yet. And I think you will not have time to do them. And which ones will you choose? And hoping you will be satisfied with how your career works out and how it's unfolded so far. I hope you're not feeling pressure. I wish for you peace as you work towards your art about and not frenzy or stress. What are you working on at the moment? How do you feel health-wise? How's your family? Because your art is not about frenzy or stress. I wish you the very best of all things and that your kindness will find a way into your last pieces. I'm still going on not knowing. That is my favorite piece. What a great letter. Yeah. I don't want to be in a frenzy either. <laughs> no? No, no. So what would you tell your cousin in a nutshell? I'm going to thank her for that letter. I'm going to write her back a snail mail letter and uh, tell her it had a great impact on me and that I'm not feeling frenzy or stress, but I am going to keep going and just make as many as I can. It's what I want to do with my life. When I was much younger, I'll just say one more thing. Somebody in their 30s told me, uh, I said, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. I could have kids and everything. I'm too, I got to stop this quilt making stuff. It takes too much time. And she, just this young person said, the world needs your quilts. Don't stop. And I, I found that very inspiring too. And I, have, I remember it. So, Judy, I wonder if, if I may as a way of giving something back to you because... Rilke is one of my all-time favorite poets, and so much of his work 
comes to mind when I find myself talking to kindred spirits like yourself. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Book of Hours. There was a translation a few years ago done by Anita Barrows and Joanna Macy that I love. It's one of the best Roka translations that I, th- I think's ever been done. And there's a poem in the Book of Hours that starts with, the hour is striking so close above me that I'd like to share with you. Because so much of what you are sharing with that, with the letter from your cousin, I think is in this, in this poem. The hour is striking so close above me, so clear and sharp that all my senses ring with it. I feel it now. There's a power in me to grasp and give shape to my world. I know that nothing has ever been real without my beholding it. All becoming has needed me. My looking ripens things and they come toward me to meet and be met. The world needs your quotes. (laughs) world needs yours too. Judy, thank you so much for spending this time with me this morning. It was really lovely talk we had. Thank you. I think one of the hallmarks of a good conversation is the ones you find yourself thinking about even long after the conversation's wrapped up. And that was the case with me and Judy. She got in touch with me a few days later and said, Zach, I just wish... I could say a few more words. So what you're about to hear is an addendum that Judy wanted to share with you. My mantra is, I have all the time in the world. And I say, say it's a mantra because I say it to myself, those words, almost every day. I have all the time in the world to convince myself to just continue working on something that might be not in my usual way. Like maybe I'm going off on a sidetrack or maybe I look at how many pieces are still not finished in my UFO pile, or maybe I want to start a new piece that I know is going to take a long time. And so I tell myself, I have all the time in the world. Because if I didn't tell myself that, I would not start those things, or I would, I I, I think it would really clamp me down as an artist. It gives me more open freedom to think that I have all the time in the world. Because our textile art, quilts, all textile art, but I'm talking about quilts and embroideries, stitch work, they're full of time. And I have all the time in the world. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Now, you don't be a stranger. Come be our guest over at the Quilting Nook. Remember, you can get your link to a free trial down in the notes below and come see for yourself what makes a nook such a special place. As always, thank you for listening. I do appreciate your time. And you know we'll be sitting and sewing again before too long here on Seamside. Take care and go sew something good. <laughs>